We're delighted you're here today. Welcome. I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. Today's program is part of the Community MLK Celebration, which commemorates the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The theme for the 2022 program is Why We Can't Wait. Check out the UVA MLK website at mlk.virginia.edu for the entire list of events. We have well over a thousand registered for Mapping the Historic Green Books, Architectural History of the African American Traveler's Guide. We're thrilled to welcome you here today, and I'm, I'm eager, just like you, to learn more about the Green Books. We received many questions in advance of this program, should you have a question during the program, please add it to the Q&A box. Our panel will answer as many questions as time permits. We are fortunate to have four knowledge experts to share with us today. Mallow Hudson, Dean of the School of Architecture, will introduce our panel and moderate the discussion. Allow me to introduce our moderator. Marlo Andre Hudson is Dean and the Edward E. Elson Professor at the University of Virginia School of Architecture. He is nationally and internationally recognized expert in the community development, climate resilience, environmental justice, and urban health. Dean Hudson is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the Salzburg Global Fellowship, two Mellon Fellowships, and a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Scholar Fellowship. Dean Hudson served as a tenured professor at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University. He served as chair of the Urban Studies Program at the University of California at Berkeley. His most recent book, The Urban Struggle for Economic, Environmental and Social Justice, Deepening Their Roots was published in 2016. Dean Hudson was invited to participate in the Obama administration's White House Forum on Environmental Justice. Dean Hudson received his PhD in Urban and Regional Planning from the School of Architecture and Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and Master of City Planning from the University of California at Berkeley. Now, please help me welcome this esteemed panel to share with us, and please help me thank Dean Hudson for moderating the discussion. Dean Hudson, the microphone is all yours. Please begin the conversation. Well, thank you so much for that nice introduction, and I just want to welcome everyone uh, to our discussion today. Uh, before we get started on me introducing the panelists, I thought I would just give a little bit of a framing about the Green Book. Uh, the Green Book was officially known as the Negro Motorist Green Book or the Negro's Traveler's Green Book, and it was first published in 1936 by Victor Hugo Green from Harlem, New York, who was actually a, a U.S. postal worker. The Green Book provided Black safe passage when traveling around the U.S. and eventually other parts of the world. The Green Book was viewed as a survival guide by Blacks from segregation, violence, discrimination that Blacks faced before the Civil Rights era. For many Blacks, traveling while Black, that was often referred as, required preparation. This could literally mean the difference between life and death. There were many places where Blacks could not be served or could not go, such as restaurants, hotels, motels, doctor's offices, and so many other places. There are some instances where there were situations where there are sundown towns. These are places where blacks were not welcome and needed to be gone after dark. From, uh, if you looked at the Route 66 from Chicago to Los Angeles uh, during the pre-civil rights era, of the 44 of the 89 counties along Route 66, uh, they were sundown towns. When the Green Book first began, it originally listed locations primarily in New York City uh, with many of the establishments in Harlem, but soon expanded nationally and even internationally by enlisting over 9,500 places, which you'll hear more about from our colleagues today. And it had hit a height of about 15,000 uh, publications a year, so copies a year were sold. 
On the other side of uh, the negativity that required the, the creation of the Green Book, what ended up happening for many Blacks is they were able to network and create and have a list of businesses that, or establishments that would cater to them. So this allowed Blacks to create their own spaces where they could vacation for pleasure. Oftentimes in the Green Book, you would see the term for rest, relaxation, and recreation. There are many popular destinations uh, with beachfront places, places in the mountains, places where Blacks can go and feel safe and bond with one another. The Green Book listed several successful Black-owned businesses, especially Black women-owned businesses. Uh, and they played a, an important role in the civil rights era. And they also were safe places for Blacks who were traveling, certainly as the uh, automotive industry grew, Blacks moved into the middle class and, and got cars. And they also were participating in traveling across the US and going to other places, whether it be from the North to the South, South to the North or out to the West. Uh, the Green Book really played a role in helping to connect uh, Blacks to these important places and where they would also have opportunity to meet other Blacks from across the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, this is quite important and you'll hear more about that from our panelists today. So with that short framing, why don't I turn to our panelists and they can provide you with much more context and then uh, I'll save a little bit of time for some questions and we'll have a little bit of dialogue. Our first speaker is award-winning architectural historian Catherine W. Zeff who studies the underdogs of American architectural history. With an interest in race and gender, Zeph reconstructs lost or overlooked histories, providing a new, often surprising viewpoint on the traditional narrative. Recent projects include Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, a book that examines Wright's career before the, before the construction of Falling Water and the architecture of the Negro Traveler's Green Book, a public catalog of Green Book sites. Our second panelist will be Olivia Petty. She is a second year student at the University of Virginia. That's right, a second year student, you heard me correctly, at the University of Virginia, studying American studies and art history. Olivia brings a deep curiosity for storytelling and how it can be used as a tool to create impact, whether it is through historical, visual, or entrepreneurial means. She is a research assistant for the architecture of the Negro Traveler's Green Book, a gallery assistant for the Ruffin Gallery and a consultant for the Speaking Center at UVA. Welcome, Olivia. And lastly, we'll have Louis P. Nelson, who is a professor of architectural history and the vice provost for academic outreach in the office of the provost at the University of Virginia. He is a specialist in the built environments of the early modern Atlantic world with published work on the American South, the Caribbean, and West Africa. His research engages the spaces of enslavement in West Africa and in the Americas, working to document and interpret the buildings and landscapes that shaped the transatlantic slave trade. Nelson is working on a second collaborative project to understand the University of Virginia as a landscape of slavery. That important work combined with the events of August 2017 led to Nelson's co-edited book of essays, Charlottesville 2017, The Legacy of Race and Inequity, an increased focus on outreach into the community. His firsthand experience with the recent conflicts in Charlottesville combined, Charlottesville combined with his enslaved labor research brings an informed scholarly perspective to global racial issues, historical and present. This makes Nelson a sought after speaker in Charlottesville across the country and internationally. Nelson is an accomplished scholar with two book link monographs published by UNC and Yale University Presses three edited collections of essays, two terms as senior co-editor of Buildings and Landscapes, the leading English language venue for scholarship on vernacular architecture and numerous articles. So as you can see from our panelists, you're in great hands. And with that said, why don't I turn it over to Catherine to lead us in, in today's discussion. Thank you so much, Dean Hudson. It is a great pleasure to meet you, if virtually. I am going to share my screen, if everybody could be patient for just a quick minute. All right. Welcome, everybody. I really wish I could see all of you in person, but this is wonderful because it allows us to reach new people that wouldn't have been able to attend in person. And so I am delighted to be here. The Architecture of the Negro Traveler's Green Book is a public architectural history project that studies the sites listed in the Green Book to discover their histories and support their preservation. It reveals the histories behind the women who ran tourist homes, the uh, men who 
saw opportunity and opened motels because of, of increased traffic. And the businessmen, businessmen who financed new establishments that offered beauty, entertainment, and style to middle-class African-Americans. These unsung people were the backbone of the African-American travel industry. And through this project, we've learned a lot about them. So it's always nice to know who knows a little bit of what uh, in your audience. And could we have poll question one, please? And I'll just keep going for the moment. So the buildings reflect the history of uh, the African-American experience of travel. Some buildings document the succeeding eras of ownership by whites and then African-Americans, while others were purpose-built by African-American owners as they seized opportunities for new economic growth. Many buildings in formerly bustling downtown areas have fallen on hard times with poverty and neglect leaving only remnants of once vibrant places. Others have survived and some have thrived. The architecture of the Negro Travelers Green Book is the only digital database dedicated to studying the architecture of these important sites and the only one with the goal of fully documenting every site listed in the Green Book. Our scope is deliberately ambitious designed to collect all this information in one place so that scholars, historians, preservationists, and everyone else can use our data as a foundation for their own future work. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, that's awesome. 93% of you have already heard about the Green Book and that's really terrific. And to those of you uh, who are new to the Green Book, uh, welcome and uh, we hope you learn a little more about it. Well, as you might expect, a project of this ambition was not born overnight. Myself and my two co-founders, Ann Bruder, uh, MAH96, and Susan Hellman, MAH97, Wahua, have been working on it since 2016, when the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center announced that they had digitized their entire collection of green books. Like many other people, we were inspired by what the Schomburg had made accessible and curious about what had happened in our own states. So we compiled the listings in our states, consulted our local primary sources, including deeds, directories, census records, historic maps, and other images, and met with key members in our local African-American communities. We assembled all this information into a poster format and took it to our first academic conference. Unexpectedly, we were inundated with a host of other scholars wanting to do similar research in their states. With their help, the project evolved into an effort to document the history and status of every building listed in the Negro Travelers Green Book. This website and the grassroots effort, uh, effort behind it is dedicated to that goal. Now, from the beginning, we knew that this project needed to have a public online component, but the intricacies of the data made just making a database very tricky. Whatever database we constructed needed to account for what could be 50 different approaches to the topic. We investigated story maps, GIS, Google Maps, WordPress, and many, many others to a dizzying extent. After considerable research, we asked Worthy Martin, PhD, Director of the Institute for Advanced Technologies in the Humanities, or IAP, at the University of Virginia to partner with us. Dr. Martin has proven to be a valuable contributor and over the last two years has furthered our project considerably. With Martin's help, we have crafted an interactive database that accommodates the realities of our research. No small task, considering that every state's green book listings are different. On the back end, Martin has designed a template that allows each researcher to enter data uniformly, ensuring consistent presentation of the data regardless of a site's location. This template helps our growing team of researchers capture a wide range of information, such as each, each site's current state of preservation, location, description, and history. On the front end, our users will be able to interface with the data from multiple perspectives and can search for owners or visitors, types of businesses, and or locations at street, town, and state levels. You wanna see the sites on a map? You can do that. Interested in owners? There's a way to search for them. In short, we're trying to anticipate how future scholars might need to use our data for their own projects and build for those needs from scratch right into our database. We've learned a lot along the way. For starters, the Green Book was not the only travel guide published during the pre-civil rights era. There were at least six others that we have been able to identify. They span two eras, primarily those printed before World War II and those after. There are distinctions and each have their own market as you can imagine. 
the covers say a lot about these differences. But the Green Book was best known and ran for the longest period of time from 1937 to 1966, 67. There was a joint uh, issue for two years. When Victor Green, a 44 year old mail carrier in New York City began publishing the Negro Motorist Green Book in 1937, segregation had been a fact of life for almost 40 years. The first year's guide covered New York City and listed gas stations and hotels, as well as tourist homes um, in the New York City vicinity. Green compiled these listings from his own experiences and from those of his fellow mail carriers. Now the Green Book rapidly took off. By 1938, just a year later, Green had expanded his listings beyond New York City to include cities and towns in 21 states and Washington, DC. There were also listings for summer resorts at the end of the guide. The Green Book was sold in black churches and through the Negro Urban League, but the support given it by the ESSO or Standard Oil Corporation S -O -S -O, was particularly key. ESSO gas stations, one of the few that served African-Americans, carried the Green Book at their stations as early as 1940. The 1949 edition included an endorsement from ESSO. Within 10 years, the directory had expanded to include 46 states and had reached its height of a 20,000 issue print run. The published guide was quite small, about six inches by four inches and easily fit into the car's glove box. Over time, as the guide expanded, readers joined postal carriers in submitting listings, making it one of the first African-American travel guides to incorporate user-generated content and probably one of the first travel guides period to generate to use user-generated content. Although the actual pages were modest and the listing Spartan, inclusion in the Green Book was considered an honor. So I'd like to ask poll, for poll question three at the moment. Um, I always wonder, this is a good moment to ask, uh, did you ever use the Green Book? I often find a lot of people did. Now, Victor Green was an idealistic and hopeful man. He wrote in the 1948 volume, quote, there will be a day sometime in the future, in the near future, when this guide will not have to be published. That is when we as a race will have equal opportunities and privileges in the United States. It will be a great day for us to suspend this pub publication for then we can go wherever we please and without embarrassment, unquote. Green retired in 1952 to publish the Green Book full time. While he lived comfortably, he never made millions preferring to keep the Green Book's prices low. Originally 25 cents, the guide's purchase costs reach a maximum of only a dollar throughout its run. The final editions contained about 100 pages of listings that covered the entire United States and abroad. Wow, that's really remarkable. Yeah, um, so the answer was 9% of you said yes. You knew somebody who had used the Green Book for travel or perhaps you yourself used the Green Book, but 91% said no, and that's really interesting. Um, and I hope maybe we can hear a little more about that. Uh, at some point, please reach out to us if you have experiences. We'd, we'd love to know more. The Green Book's demise is often attributed to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which in theory rendered its fundamental concept obsolete. In fact, Victor Green had died in 1960, leaving the guide without its driving visionary, and the publication was sold before its 1963-64 its volume. But the increase in civil rights activities during the late 1960s raised question as to whether publications like the Green Book undermined the push for full equality by advocating that African-Americans support only black businesses. And the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. brought many black leaders to rethink their approach to the fight for civil rights. I'm abbreviating this moment in history quite substantially. This is a very complex moment in time, um, but I would recommend Marsha Chatelain's book, Franchise, which talks about this moment quite a bit um, uh, and, and worth the read. So sales of the Green Book began to erode during the 1960s and the Green Book came to an end in 1967. Now our scholars form the backbone of this project. To date, we have people researching Green Book sites in Arkansas, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Illinois, Iowa, Maryland, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Michigan, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, and Virginia. Don't panic if you haven't heard your state, we're getting there. We have found that for our project, the more is definitely the merrier. States with more researchers do better than those who don't. And we continue to recruit. 
By 2025, we anticipate having scholars at work in all 50 states, as well as in Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. Many of our affiliated scholars work for historic preservation offices or in cultural resource management firms. A handful are academics. There is no compensation. Everybody works for free. As we began, expand beyond our original states, we have been fortunate to have the assistance of two researchers, both students at the University of Virginia. Olivia Petty and Melanie York joined our project as part of a university-wide program to connect first-year undergraduates with research projects affiliated with the university. Now second-year students, Petty and York, have completed many tasks that help our other researchers, such as compiling town state listings and establishing initial data spreadsheets. Their work is supported by UVA, and we are so grateful to them and to UVA for their efforts on our project. The future for our project is bright. In addition to serving as an aggregator for other projects on the Green Book's history, we hope to facilitate efforts to preserve these sites, both at the local and the national level. Our information will be vital to those working on projects large and small, from nominating these buildings to the National Register for Historic Places, to community members seeking to know more about their local history. As we continue to do our research, we look forward to the continued conversation with the public that our work inspires. Thank you, and I'm delighted to turn things over to Olivia, one of our star undergraduates who will no doubt impress you. Thank you, Catherine. My role within the architecture of the Negro Travelers Green Book has been in two areas. The first is to lay the groundwork in the database and create the initial spreadsheets of listings. The aim of this process is to ensure that every site under every state and every edition of the Green Book is documented. In terms of numbers, Melanie York, who is also a research assistant on this project, and I have recorded Green Book sites for 32 states, which is approximately 5,600 listings in total. The type of information that Melanie and I have collected for these spreadsheets is exactly what you see when you open the Green Book. Let's look at the 1938 edition, for example. Each edition is organized by state and then alphabetically by town. Under each town are listings available to that particular place by category. As an example of how a traveler might have used the Green Book, you were driving to New York City and needed a place to stay, you would open the Green Book and consult the hotel listings under New York City. You might also notice the reference to the 1940 World's Fair in the paragraph in the top right corner. With such ads and information, the Green Book spoke directly to the social, political, and cultural undercurrents of these specific locations, especially in New York City, which has almost a thousand listings alone. This is what that same page from the 1938 edition charting all the New York City listings looks like from the back end, from Melanie and I's perspective. The information that we have collected includes the name of the listing, the address, and the type of listing that it is. So is it a hotel, a restaurant, a tailor, or a beauty parlor, et cetera. And what's interesting is that these listings evolve from year to year. Some Green Book sites appear for a duration of some years, while others don't. In many cases, sites are only listed for one edition. Addresses change, and in some cases, no address is listed at all. Melanie and I have combed through each edition and logged which years these sites appear, and which they don't in order to track how these places might have fluctuated in terms of time and in terms of space. One thing I've learned from the documentation process is that these changes throughout the edition are a testament to Victor Green's determination to make this the best product that he could. These sites had been selected with the utmost care. A great example of how the Green Book evolved over its publication period is the 1947 edition. The 1947 edition reflects an important shift since from 1942 to 1946, the Green Book went on a temporary hiatus because of paper rationing during World War II. The 1947 edition ushered in a new feel for the Green Book compared to the previous edition and the 1940 edition on your left. The cover appeared with a new design and a subtitle that read, a classified motorist and tourist guide covering the United States. The tagline at the bottom, carry your Green Book with you, you may need it, appeared in the, on the cover in every subsequent edition. The 1947 edition also illustrates that the Green Book had always been so much more than a travel guide. It was an educational resource that served to empower readers at a time when Black Americans who had fought for freedom abroad also had to fight for freedom at home. Victor Green recognized the need to equip readers with knowledge, which is why the 1947 edition opens with a seven page list of Black colleges and universities. Among them that are still in operation on this list are Spelman and Morehouse Colleges in Atlanta, Howard University and Washington DC, 
and the Hampton Institute, now called Hampton University, which isn't too far from the University of Virginia. The Green Book was about, was about much more than the listings themselves, especially in the later editions where a greater emphasis was placed on national and international vacation spots. A great example of this is the 1963 to 64 edition, which contains a section in the beginning called Your Rights, Briefly Speaking, which lists anti-discrimination statutes for public accommodations and recreation so that travelers knew their rights when visiting these places. It also lists addresses where readers could direct any refusal of service or mistreatment they encountered in some states. These types of articles speak to how this publication was used in its historical moment to keep black travelers safe and give power to black owned businesses and entrepreneurs through the readership of the Green Book. One of the states that is currently uploaded to our database is Virginia. The second area that I've been involved with has been to assist project co-founder Susan Hellman, who has collected information and traveled throughout the state of Virginia to photograph and locate each of the sites listed under Virginia in the Green Book. And this is no easy feat. Of these approximately 315 sites, I've been looking more deeply into the ones right here in Charlottesville, one of which is located less than a mile away from where I live. There are 12 sites in Charlottesville and one in Crozet that are listed between 1938 and 1967. Among them are four tourist homes, two dance halls, two hotels, a beauty shop, a barber shop, and two theaters. One of these theaters is the Paramount Theater, which is located right here in downtown Charlottesville. One question we received from Catherine S. and Chris E. is why the Paramount and Jefferson Theater only appear in the 1939 edition. Well, I'm not sure if this was the logic of the publishers of the Green Books, perhaps part of the reason that it only appeared in 1939 could be that the Paramount Theater was a segregated space. Candace e. Taylor, who was the leading scholar on the Green Book, writes in her book, Overground Railroad, that in the late 1930s, black patrons would enter through the third street entrance, walk up a small unlit stairway to the balcony and sit in the colored section. Another site listed under Charlottesville is the Carver Inn, which appeared from 1949 to 1967 at the address 701 Preston Avenue. According to the city directories in Charlottesville, it was run by a black woman by the name of Beatrice Folks. And according to the book, Charlottesville, an African-American community, the Carver Inn was a premier hotel and restaurant that guests such as Louis Armstrong and Hattie McDonald stayed at. The Carver Inn is one example of how the Green Book played an important role in the lives of Black women and how instrumental they were as working as entrepreneurs and proprietors of businesses. In fact, the Green Book itself was a testament to this idea. After Victor Green passed away in 1960, Alma Duke Green, Victor's wife, published the Green Book with the help of a nearly all-female staff. The Carver Inn, like more than 75% of Green Book sites, is gone. It has since been demolished. In the early 1970s, the Carver Inn was torn down when Charlottesville adopted a plan to widen Grady Avenue, and blow is what stands at the location of where the Carver Inn used to be. However, all hope is not lost. Seven of the Charlottesville listings are extant, and one of these is Joker's Barbershop. It is still operating at the location listed in the Green Book, which is now 406 Commerce Street. If you're interested in looking through the Green Book to see what listings may be near you, the Green Book can be accessed on the New York Public Library website in the Schomburg Collection. I also highly recommend Candace e. Taylor's book, Overground Railroad, which tells some of these stories and includes photographs from Green Book sites across the country, both then and now. The Green Book was much more than a AAA equivalent. It tells local and national histories about Black businesses and the communities that they served, as well as what has happened to these places since the Green Book listed them. As these spaces continue to change and local histories become erased, it is more urgent than ever to uncover these stories of success as told by the listings in the Green Book, and to most importantly, celebrate those who have paved the way. I'd like to thank Melanie York, Susan Hellman, Catherine Ziff, Ann Bruder, Worthy Martin and Lewis Nelson for their guidance and support, as well as the opportunity to be a part of this project. With that, I'd like to pass it to Mr. Lewis Nelson, who will be speaking on how this database is part of a suite of projects happening around the university. Um, thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, that was uh, yet one more reminder of how extraordinary our students here um, are at the University of Virginia. Uh, you're a real testament to the rigor and the research, um, but also the clear communication. Thank you so much for that great presentation. 
Uh, it is, has been my great honor um, to be associated with this particular project. Um, I would like to uh, just point out uh, the fact that Catherine Ziff and Susan Hellman and Ann Bruder, uh, who are the key leads uh, for this project and have been the backbone of the project from its beginning, um, are all volunteers uh, in this project. Uh, and they're also all UVA alumni. Um, uh, they do this work uh, because of, in, in part, at least because of their training in the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia. Uh, and that makes me enormously proud. Uh, there is uh, much that the University of Virginia has yet to, uh, to do and to tell and lots of repair that has yet to happen relative to the harm that we've engaged um, uh, uh, here in Virginia and uh, in our local community. But there are also incredible projects that have been uh, unfolding over recent years that are pointing towards uh, the resilience of the black community and the importance of understanding African-American history uh, in place. And so what I'd like to do is just to take a few minutes uh, before we turn over to um, some questions and answers with, um, with uh, Dean Hudson to highlight just a few key projects uh, that are also unfolding in this very moment uh, in, in relationship to uh, the Green Book, this really important Green Book project. Uh, many of our listeners, I assume, will already be familiar with the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, but I'd like to say just a few words uh, about that project. The Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, which was completed in 2020, uh, is a many years project uh, associated directly uh, with our commitment to mark our landscape um, with a memorial that uh, pays homage to and remembers the lives, uh, the loves and commitments of the enslaved community uh, that labored here at the University of Virginia for our institution's first half century. Uh, through a robust community engagement project uh, and also ultimately inspired by uh, students from the University of Virginia and specifically African-American students from the School of Architecture who launched a, a design competition in 2011 for a memorial to enslaved laborers. It was that project birthed out of the, a design competition uh, amongst student, act, student activists that really convinced the university that it was, it was both time uh, for us to undertake this uh, major step, but also um, the right thing to do. It was, it was, it was an important moment for us uh, in, in our institutional history. One of the reasons that I'm really proud of the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers is that it's rafted um, very heavily on a robust community engagement uh, program. Uh, um, uh, the president had already established, President Sullivan had already established the President's Commission on Slavery, uh, which was a, um, a multi-year research project and community engagement project to better understand both the history of slavery at the University of Virginia, but also its legacies. Uh, and that meant that that commission was comprised of large numbers of people from the community, and especially individuals who are descendants of that very same enslaved community. So that collaborative project uh, had a strong focus on community engagement and um, sitting down and listening in uh, in parlors and in living rooms and around dining room tables, but also in uh, church parish halls, uh, understanding and listening to the stories of the legacies of that particular history um, was an incredibly important precondition for the design and launch of the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers. And so when the university in 2016 actually commissioned the design team uh, to begin that project, uh, it was not at all surprised that that project uh, continued that community engagement work. Uh, comprised um, by three folks who had direct associations with the University of Virginia School of Architecture. Frank Dukes was a community engagement specialist, was part of the design team, and is a faculty member in urban and environmental planning right here in the School of Architecture. Um, so to Greg Bleen as a landscape architect here in Charlottesville and a former faculty member uh, at the University of Virginia, and Mabel Wilson, also a UVA alum, now professor at Columbia University, where uh, those three individuals together with Howler and Yoon, uh, design architects, produced a really remarkable project. But that remarkable project was really only possible because of their continued commitment uh, to sitting and listening uh, to the desires of the descendant community and the larger community uh, so that the memorial was actually a result very much of their desires. And so we're really proud of the fact that that memorial has been warmly embraced by the local community as well as our descendant community. Uh, and is a place where um, the, uh, that particular history, uh, as harmful and as dark as that history is, uh, it's a place where that history uh, really um, uh, deserves its uh, particular attention and where our descendant community uh, is taking the lead in, in, in helping us better understand 
uh, the various interpretations of that space. So the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers also recently launched a major um, uh, website, uh, which took us quite a while to produce that website. And I think it just dropped into the chat. So I'll encourage you to go to that website. And one of the things that you'll find on that website is actually a series of educational modules. As we were doing our engagement work, one of the things that became very, very clear um, is that local parents and uh, high school kids and others really wanted educational modules available on that site. So uh, John Kamazi, who's a faculty member in the School of Architecture and has a joint appointment in um, our School of Education, uh, spent an entire semester with a team of students um, developing those modules in partnership with K-12 educators. And so we started with the premise, how do we create a module that a K-12 educator can literally just download as a PDF, print out, and uh, run as a, uh, as a, a module in their classroom? Uh, and so we had UVA students working under the guidance of Professor Kamazi, uh, but also in partnership with Alexis Mason and others in our community uh, associated with both Charlottesville and Albemarle City Schools, sorry, Albemarle County and Charlottesville City Schools, uh, those educators uh, worked very closely with the students to produce modules that, uh, that would be very, very useful for them. And so we're really proud of those modules. Those modules are now up and running. I encourage you to go take a look at those. Um, and uh, this is an ongoing project. We're uh, intending to produce more modules um, every other year as, uh, as Professor Kamazi teaches this class. I'll also highlight two other projects uh, that have gotten a lot less attention, uh, deservedly. I think the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers is uh, certainly um, worthy of the national and international awards and recognition that it has received, um, but it's not the only game in town. There are other things that are happening here at UVA, and I'll just highlight two uh, that also are associated with the School of Architecture. Uh, the first is an Andrew Mellon Foundation-funded series of field schools. Uh, one of the things that the Department of Architectural History, which is my department uh, in the School of Architecture, has long been famous for, has been very careful um, uh, documentation and analysis of um, buildings and landscapes, uh, training our students to very carefully record buildings and understand that um, you can capture all kinds of important historical information when you carefully and closely look at buildings. Uh, we refer to that as field training. Um, so this particular Andrew Mellon Foundation funded a program is a series of three African-American uh, buildings and landscapes field schools that are going to happen across the American South uh, between researchers uh, that are associated with the Vernacular Architecture Forum, which is a professional organization, and local communities. And what, what I'm really proud of in this uh, particular program is that the applications, the successful applications, came forward because they were co-written between the community members or the descendants' communities and the various faculty uh, partners. And so these were not projects where the faculty partner had an idea and they just sort of said, we wanna work in that community. The faculty partner actually had to spend time building relationships of trust with that African-American community. Um, and the application came simultaneously to us from, from uh, both, uh, both sides as it were. Um, so that's a project that has now been fully funded and the first field school will begin this summer uh, for students here at UVA, but also across the country uh, to help them better understand how is it that they can actually responsibly and ethically engage with African-American communities to ensure that the, those African-American communities benefit from that particular project. So there'll be three years of those different field schools, well, five years of the field schools, three different field schools running over five years. We're very excited about that, uh, that new endeavor. And I'll end by introducing just a few components of a second Andrew Mellon Foundation funded project. This is a $5 million grant that the University of Virginia received about uh, 18 months ago. Um, uh, framed around race, place, and equity. And because, of course, it's focused on race, place, and equity, um, the School of Architecture is, uh, is right up in front in this project, which is very exciting. Um, one of the components of this is the production of a whole series of first-year classes for our incoming first-year students to help them better explore the intersection of race and place. Um, and one of the things that I'm really proud of that, you know, that we're doing in that particular project is that key faculty, like those two in the School of Architecture, like Elgin Cleckley and Professor Lisa Riley, are teaching classes where they're actually taking students out to sites and engaging with the, um, the curators of those various sites and the traditional knowledge holders and stewards of those sites. So, for example, this particular uh, uh, Mellon-funded program uh, has as its key partners, the Jefferson School for African-American Heritage and Culture, which is one of our partners downtown. Um, so the students are going to the Jefferson School and talking with the curators and understanding those exhibits. Uh, but they're also engaging directly with the descendant community, the descendants to enslaved laborers that are associated here with the University of Virginia. And the descendants community actually uh, worked in partnership with the faculty to develop the syllabi for those classes. 
And so the descendant community uh, have ownership over some of the content uh, in those classes, and they're actually helping us to deliver, uh, to deliver that content for the students. And so they're getting direct student relationship building and direct exposure to the students through that particular project. And that's really exciting. And our, uh, one of our uh, other community partners for these uh, first year seminar classes um, is the Monacan Nation. Uh, so the University of Virginia stands on the uh, traditional lands of the Monacan Nation. And they have their headquarters in Amherst County. Uh, the University of Virginia has been building a, a relationship of trust slowly and over time with the Monacan Nation. And we're very excited that they were willing to come to the table as one of our community partners. And so some uh, subset of our uh, student groups uh, in that one credit class actually drove to Amherst County and went to Bear Mountain, which is the, um, the seat of the Monacan Nation and engaged with uh, the Monacan uh, elders. Uh, and we're also, I'm also very excited to say that this particular um, uh, grant has also recently uh, funded uh, a tribal fellow. And so a representative from the Monica Nation is actually gonna be in residence here at the University of Virginia as a tribal expert um, and available to faculty for uh, questions and answers um, in their various classes uh, as, a, um, as an expert speaker on um, uh, Native American uh, traditions and practices and the relationships uh, in the present, politics in the present. So there is so much going on across the University of Virginia as it relates to issues of African-American history um, and African-American place. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to offer that larger context for this really incredible uh, project around uh, the Negro, um, or around the Green Book. And I'm so grateful for uh, these volunteer uh, alumni who have stepped up to do this really remarkable project and so proud, so proud of Olivia uh, and Melanie York, uh, the two students who are helping to support this project. Um, and now we'll just turn it over to uh, Dean Mala Hudson, and uh, happy to step in and answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists. And if you would uh, like to turn on your your video again, we can get started with some of the questions that have been coming in. One question, one series of questions that have a similar theme, and this is directed towards Catherine. But Olivia, please jump in, or, or Lewis, if you feel fit, is that you mentioned Catherine? You mentioned in your presentation that the Green Book, uh, one of the geniuses of it, it, it had user generated content. Right. So uh, Mr. Hugo was relying on other people to provide information and then they put in the book similar things as you were presenting many people, um, I, I presume black families that or others that just use the book talked about their own experiences today and, I, and many people are wondering how can they share information or be involved in the research project and how do you kind of approach that and then I have a follow up question somewhat related and touches on some of the things that were discussed earlier. So many people have said, I've experienced this. There's someone talking about getting their haircut at Jokers and, uh, or their family uses the Green Book. How can they share this information and be, or, or if they're volunteers who might wanna participate? So the wonderful thing about having a name like Ziff is that I am super easy to find. Um, I am Catherine Ziff on Twitter and please reach out to me via Twitter. Um, I am also easily found on LinkedIn. Um, and I do check those often. Uh, Faye, I did get your emails earlier today, your, um, your contact, uh, she hit me through both directions. So just to show everybody that they both work. Um, and I will be reaching out, as you can see, I've just been a little busy this afternoon, but I will be getting back to you. And uh, we very much want to hear from, uh, especially people who have experiences with the Green Book or with any of the sites in the Green Book. These kinds of presentations tend to bring that information out in wonderful ways. Uh, I did a presentation in Newport, Rhode Island and uh, ran across a whole host of people who remembered one of the sites uh, very fondly um, and as a center of, of female black empowerment, which was really wonderful to hear the stories of. So yes, please reach out and uh, I will definitely get back in touch. And if I don't get back in touch right away, uh, don't be shy about nudging me. Um, I just, I sometimes get a little busy, um, but that's a great question. And, and we do hope you will reach out. And then just a follow up question about as this research project expands, um, are you looking for funding or do you have plans to partner with other institutions or bring in additional funding where you might have partnerships across the country um, or in the community? Uh, do you have any plans around that? There's some questions around that as well. Yeah, I mean, we are uh, always happy to receive money. Um, and especially because right now, the money that we do have has gone towards two very important uh, components of our project. One is, of course, all of the programming that goes on behind the scenes of the database. And that is no small task. That was one of the really significant barriers we found when we were investigating all the story maps and, and the GIS and such was uh, the considerable amount of, of programming that goes on behind it. 
And we were so grateful to Worthy Martin um, for stepping forward uh, to partner with us on this because he has contributed many, many hours of programming that was just simply beyond our reach as three independent scholars. Um, and then of course, the second thing that funding for our project goes to is to keep Olivia and Melanie and hopefully a whole host of future generations of uh, students, scholars. Um, I, I, I hope you all have been very impressed with Olivia here and Melanie is wonderful as well. Um, and um, they have both risen to the occasion in, in the lovely unexpected way that students do. And uh, it's really terrific. And so we would love to keep going and, and keep having them on. Um, so yes, uh, if that, would, that may have perhaps gone by a little quickly on the, the screen there, but uh, if you earmark your donation to IATH, the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities slash Green Books, it will get to us. And, and we are so grateful. Thank you so much. I want to follow up with uh, some more related questions, that, which was presented today, is, is the importance of historic preservation. As I started off, and as many of you discussed, the importance of history, the role that many of these sites play, uh, whether it be the businesses themselves, the amount of, uh, you know, if you think back through history, some of the sites where it, they were Black millionaires, and they were women-owned Black businesses, and they were part of the civil rights movement. And so they're of, of a, a great historic significance. And there are a number of questions about historic preservation and what could be done to preserve them. And I'll just read one question that kind of captures it. But overall, there are a number of questions kind of around this area. It says, African-American history has not received the same level of investment in preservation that other areas of US history have. How can land trusts or historic preservation groups use the Green Book to map to use use the Green Book maps to identify cultural heritage sites, historic sites in Virginia and others, or even you know along those lines of saying what can we do to preserve the sites that are are still there? We know that they may be falling into disrepair, or they may be um, you know in in the site of maybe being torn down, plans to be torn down. So what can we do? And I know that's really important as a dean of School of Architecture as we think about history and, and, and certainly uh, the role is played. So one of the things that's really wonderful about our project is how many people working in state historic preservation offices we have who have done considerable research on uh, their own green book sites in their own states. And uh, it, for those who know preservation, um, many of the first line of, of defense, if you will, of pre pre for preserving a site is listing on the National Register or listing on any one of the number of local historic districts, um, all of those things that many people like to complain about having to do, but the reality of it is they work. And none of that can happen for any site unless you know what it is, you can identify it, you can map it, you can say something about the history. And so one of the key things we hope our project will do is just simply generate the inventories for, uh, for this level of um, preservation. For example, there are, are many um, projects that are floated to say, uh, preserve the green book sites that are located along Route 66. And that is all well and good, except that nobody knows what they are. And so what we hope is that our project will uh, really put that information uh, in one place so that uh, those types of nominations can move forward so that the states can say uh, in say, uh, you know, uh, well, Tennessee is a terrific example because we have several, um, uh, we have a wonderful team there, many with UVA effect affiliations. Um, not that it's all UVA, but uh, it's much UVA and that's great. Um, but in Tennessee, they have a very full and robust list of, of um, uh, uh, research done into their green book sites. And as a result, they've been able to move forward with um, all kinds of uh, listings and such. And I, I think Lewis might wanna tell us a little about some of the efforts in Virginia to that effect. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, of course, the School of Architecture at UVA has for many, many years uh, been seeking to document um, a wide range of buildings across the state of Virginia. And I do think that uh, Catherine is exactly right that listing uh, is one of the first major steps that uh, we can take. Um, but it's also really important that we carefully and accurately document these buildings in the landscape. And so I think the there's a, there's a sort of beautiful synergy between this process of both identifying um, and listing as well as documenting these buildings uh, simultaneously. Th those things are really important. And I would highlight that um, uh, it's important for us to digest the simple fact that we preserve buildings that tell stories that we value, right? We preserve buildings that tell stories that we value. 
And as um, the uh, uh, as as historic preservation has unfolded over so many of the uh, uh, past decades, um, the, there has been very little uh, interest or concern for uh, African-American sites, just more generally at the, at the local and the state level. That's changing and that's really exciting. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important about that uh, is that uh, so often narrat uh, historical narratives can kind of go in one ear and out the other. But one of the things that I've learned as I've taught here at UVA now for 20 years is that when you tie history to buildings, it's much less difficult. It's much, it's much more difficult to, uh, to unlearn it, right? Um, that as soon as you have the visual cue of certain associations, certain narratives associated with a particular building or street or space, then every time you occupy that space, if it's in your local community, you're still reminded of that, uh, of that narrative. And so I think it's so incredibly important as we're at a national moment trying to grapple with uh, the telling of African-American history and amplifying the, uh, the lives of African-Americans and their contributions to the making of the nation and Black resilience, um, that we need to do so not just in the abstract, but also in the particular. And that's one of the reasons why documenting sites in the Green Book makes such an incredibly important difference. Um, it's so critical that we both identify, say, uh, see, and save uh, these buildings because they're part of a landscape that has, until very recently, been both overlooked and entirely ignored. Thank you. Catherine, there are many requests. Can you repeat the donation website? Maybe you can post it up. Uh, but many people are asking, could you repeat that? So just to put that out there. Yeah. Uh, another question that comes up, and it's a it's a really important practical question, is uh, when Mr. Green started the Green Book, and as it expanded to some fifteen thousand copies a year, uh, how who supported that? How was it sort of supported? Was paid for? I know you mentioned uh, Esso Standard Oil before, Catherine, but can you give us some insight on who might have been advertising in it? Uh, and also related to that, there was a question earlier about what kind of places were there natural park, uh, natural locations, recreation places, like national parks, things like that listed. So any of you can answer, Olivia, please jump in as well. Yeah, I can hop in and answer the second part of that question just about the national parks. Um, I would say in the later editions is where you get more just vacation and recreational um, listings. I know I can't pinpoint the exact year, but there actually is a year where in California, a lot of national parks are listed. Um, there was special editions for railroad. I think, I believe the 1951 edition um, was made especially for that. I would say that um, for the most part, it's not unusual to find listings of parks um, just throughout the green book. It was much more than just hotels or even restaurants. I, I think at times there were some sites that maybe even didn't even fall into a specific category. I've just from going through so many editions, you sometimes find sites that you're really never expecting to see, like the name of, there was one for a private investigator, or oftentimes there were sites for tailors. Um, but I think for the most part, even towards the end of the Green Book, there was a section called the Vacation Guide, which listed sites just specifically for vacation. And even towards the end, there were sites from Mexico, Bermuda, the Caribbean, um, even from some African countries. So, National Parks and Recreation definitely played a role um, in just sort of including these listings in the Green Book. Catherine, anything to add or we can... Uh, I know, I, I was going to leave it to Olivia because of course Olivia is better positioned to talk about Virginia. I, I could talk about those things for Rhode Island, but I don't think anybody cares, or at least I do, but... <laughs> So that so that but the advertising and then related to that we can uh, is many people are asking about the international locations. I know Canada, Mexico, and many of those. Olivia, you just mentioned uh, what was the story behind that? If you have a, a brief moment to say anything about it, if you know anything, or any any of you just can answer that. Yes. So yeah. So so the international listings are something we're still working towards. Um, so we don't know a lot about the international listings, except that there were uh, quite a number um, outside of the United States in, in places uh, peripherally, obviously, where African-Americans would want to travel, uh, travel where everybody else does. Um, so we don't know quite a lot about uh, the international listings as yet. Part of the ambition of the project is to uh, get to the international listings so that we can learn more about them. I think one of the things that's so fascinating about this project is that the micro histories build into such interesting stories. 
And we learn so much just from the building, just the little, think of it like the little bricks of a brick wall that build up. Um, so it is interesting to think about African-American travel through the lens of the expansion of the Green Book as, as Olivia so, so brilliantly explained that the Green Book was about more than just uh, listing black businesses. It was about many, many things. And so you see the, the ambitions of international travel fitting within that, that broad scope as, of expansion and, and really where can we go with this? And uh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see how uh, Victor Green is thinking about travel and, and what he can do with this guide. So I, I guess the real answer is stay tuned. A good question related to, the, to that is some people have asked you, do, do we have, a, I know we don't know the exact number of sites may be difficult that have survived since, but do you have a percentage of might still be around? Do you know by any chance? Um, estimate or has anyone done any calculation? Well, the, the calculations, to be honest, they seem to vary. Um, and I will tell you the story that uh, when I researched the sites in Rhode Island, there are 24 sites in Rhode Island and uh, half of them survive. And I thought, oh my Lord, 50% uh, you know, of them are gone. That's just awful. And then uh, our team in North Carolina came forward and said, well, they calculated their uh, percent loss and it's 11%. And so suddenly my 50%, which initially looked terrible, looked pretty good. And so I think these are, these are numbers that um, we're still calculating overall uh, as we gain more knowledge about it. Some sites just fared better. Uh, some sites didn't. And um, my, my, my colleague, Ann Bruder, will tell you that uh, she's researched Baltimore. And uh, when I-95 went, went through Baltimore, I mean, there went 50 Green Book sites. Um, so I think the answer is, I mean, I, I know 75% is bad, 75% loss is bad at around 25% survival is bad at around quite a bit. And it's probably about in that ballpark, but we don't know for sure. We're, we're still working towards that. And, and as you can see between Rhode Island and North Carolina, that's, that's a big difference. Yes. And one of the sad things about uh, Mr. Green's legacy is he passed away right before the passage of civil rights legislation. And there was a question, have, have you heard from his family at all or reached out to them or is, is any, any reactions to this research? Uh, so we have not largely because we've been down in the, in the lovely, delightful weeds of our individual listings. Um, the scholar who has reached out to Victor Green's family is Candace Taylor. And she has written a book called Overground Railroad. We referenced it and I believe it may be in the chat. Um, it's a fabulous book. And um, she, has, uh, she has consulted with the family and uh, much of that information is in her book. Um, she is a wonderful researcher and we have very much enjoyed following along. We feel that our project is a little bit different with a little bit of a different agenda. Um, she's looking to really research the history of the large green book from a, a, a you know, a, a, a a high up view, whereas we really are looking at the sites themselves individually and, and really kind of building out what we learn from those sites from there. Um, I know, and it's, I know Althea would like us to wrap up, um, but just to quickly say that as we get into the details of this, we learn an incredible amount. Um, and so I hope that we can keep going and, and keep finding these things out. And thank you, while well, I have the floor, thank you. Uh, Catherine, um, before you disappear, can you put in the chat um, the site for donations? We're getting tons of questions about donations. Yes, I um, just did just now. Okay. Uh, hopefully it's Great. there. And thank you everybody for your donations. We very much appreciate it. Great. And also, can you one more time put your um, contact information in the chat and send it out to everyone? I will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, panel, thank you. This was wonderful. What... <laughs> What great information that we learned here today. Um, my family certainly used the Green Book uh, to travel. Uh, I heard from an uncle. He said he was using it up into the early 70s. So copies must have stuck around for a while. So thank you so much for sharing your research and educating us about the Green Book today. It's been a, an informative afternoon. Um, so thank you. Thank you all. Um, audience, thanks for sticking with us. Um, I'd love to share some upcoming events um, that will just keep you in the know. The MLK keynote address uh, is Thursday, January 28th at 6 p.m. Yamish Alcindar on Black History and Legacy of MLK Purpose, Truth, and Justice. If you haven't registered, there's time. Go to mlk.virginia.edu backslash events. Also some lifetime learning events coming up. 
Saving St. Uh, John School and the Rosenwald School Legacy. That's on February 6, uh, 17th at 3 p.m. Uh, check out our website for that. Also, we're planning a program on Booker T. Washington in February. More details coming. So visit uh, engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. There's a great program coming up on the 28th. That's Friday at 11 a.m. offered by the Miller Center. Is democracy essential to U.S. and China relations? Our UVA alumni and parent travel will host Paris, the African American Experience on May 28th through June 5th. Register for that great program. Uh, from your friends here at Lifetime Learning, thank you for joining us today. Please stay safe and healthy. Have a great afternoon. See you soon.